Hello and welcome everyone to this week's episode of Double DM Podcast, where we are discussing using one shots for world building and generally world building outside your game more or less for your game that includes finding inspiration once again that includes how you can best world build for the game while not actively playing the game and a lot more but first as every week we are here to discuss what happened in that certain week and Niels How are you doing today? I'm doing tired, but other than that, I'm fine. I'm doing tired. Yeah, I don't know why, but it, I'm just, I mean, it's not especially early or anything. Yeah. But today is just, today is just, but yeah, other than that, I'm fine. How about you? How was... It, tired. Uh, okay. Tired. Very, <laughs> very fucking tired. Perfect, um, perfect. I did start um, on a certain New Year's resolution already. Okay. That, that is be... to drink way less caffeine. Mm -hmm. <laughs> mm -hmm. I'm not uh, cutting caffeine out entirely from my system because I think I still do rely on it quite a bit to at least be functioning at work at some point sometimes. Mm -hmm. But I've decided to go for more... Um, juice drinks instead of for example i don't know a bottle of coke um like every two or three days cutting a bit of caffeine out has obviously had its impacts but it's better to cut out at least some of it um slowly um to yeah. get to a level where i say it is once again okay to drink right I'm, i'm not wanting to cut out caffeine entirely even if some people might say that that's the best thing to do i want to have some caffeine um i like my energy drinks still when i have a long session of work or other things to do at night but um, i don't want to basically drink is an energy drink every single morning or every single day at least and then have that one that i still need to do the late night session of stuff still be needed why do you have to call me out like this because i do not have a problem yet but i don't want it to develop into a problem that's why i'm calling out my shit mm -hmm. okay cool 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 yeah i just want to make sure that that i don't basically take too much caffeine into my system and make it normal mm. okay okay mm. Mm -hmm. cool cool mm -hmm. cool, cool. Mm -hmm. that reminds me of my sunday <laughs> 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 okay. Oh, I'm so sorry. I'm so, All so good. sorry. All good. Um, yeah, I was working on yeah. Sunday because uh, we are just so fucking understaffed. So we had to work on Sunday. Beautiful, right? Perfect. Whoa. The fun thing is, uh, on Saturday, I was on late shift. So I got off at half past 10 and Sunday started at 8 a.m. Mm -hmm. it, 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 sleep wasn't much there. <laughs> In that instance, I would totally be okay to drink a caffeinated beverage because I would need it. You, you say one. That's cute. I, how um, many ever you need. The thing, however, is that mm -hmm. I do not want to drink caffeinated beverages when I just drink them for fun. Okay. Yeah, okay. I, I get that. I get that. But let me tell you, four coffees and four energy drinks wasn't enough. It wasn't. I was still done four coffees yeah four energy drinks yeah to be fair not all before 8 a.m the coffees were uh-huh yeah but the rest stretched out from eight to da, 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 let me da, four, you know that one one energy drink has like 300 percent of the caffeine intake you should you should have per day i know how was your monday good perfect actually you didn't have like any single crash nothing yes you no. might have a problem <laughs> <laughs> Tell me something new. <laughs> no. Okay. The, okay. The things I don't I don't feel them anymore. I just notice my brain suddenly can keep up with all my thoughts, kind of. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Welcome to the I know, pack, motherfucker. I know the exact <laughs> feeling. <laughs> However, <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah, but that okay. that's not the normal state. Okay. I have to state that it's not a normal Sunday morning for me to drink yeah. that much caffeine. Yeah. Usually, I just have my one coffee or two coffees in the morning, and that's it. That's normally that. That's okay, right? It's yeah. That was an extreme case of I am so fucked that, up. And that was an extreme case of I need to work and I can only work if I bala my brain too. I, I need to work but I don't want to and I just want to I just want you all of you to fuck off. That that was the vibe on Sunday. But yeah, I'm good. I don't have any issues with that. But good for you. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Um it's been um 
Yeah. Otherwise that, it's been a very uneventful week. Mm -hmm. All right. All right. Nothing TTRPG wise happened? No. Sadly, sadly not. Mm. Um, my tyranny group on Tuesday cancelled um, as um, someone seems to have bigger things to do than play TTRPGs with us. Mm -hmm. My Thursday group is supposedly falling through until the new year as well. Mm -hmm. So aside from Sunday this week, I have no TTRPGs anymore mm -hmm. this mm -hmm. month. I think. Next Tuesday I don't. Next Thursday I don't. I don't have something on the weekends next week. I'm completely free next week. Then it's Christmas time and I totally understand that that last week of the year, it's very hard to do something. We are, however, trying to schedule a tyranny session in that time frame. Okay. In that last week of the year. Mm -hmm. But none of my players are responding to me when I mm -hmm. say, okay, let's take this date. And something that I've taken um, as liberty when no one replies to my um, suggestion Suggestions of when to meet up is okay. So you all are available, and if and if someone mm -hmm. of you isn't present, I will take that as a you never want to play again. No, so far so far we are looking at probably some TTRPGs in that last week, um, but that's still very much out on the horizon and could happen, could not happen. I wouldn't know that. All right. So all right. no TTRPGs for me this week, only on Sunday. I have a session but my players will fight an assassin hack coven. Okay. Three hacks that have all basically assassin -y abilities that mm -hmm. will attack them because uh, they've been put up. Basically, they've gotten a contract on the heads of the players. Mm -hmm. And the players will have assassin to figure that out. Coven. Yes. That sounds fun. One of them has a dagger that silences the target. One of them has claws that disables arcane focuses and component pouches. And one of them binds their hands together, making it unable to use somatic components. Yikes. Okay, sounds like a lot of fun. Yeah, and they are oh, yeah. very, very dangerous when fought up close as well. Obviously. Yeah, no shit with a dagger that silences and all of that stuff. Yeah, I mean, but, does, right, but all of these hacks are basically meant to kill mages, mm -hmm. right? I silence you, you can't use your verbal components. I bind your hands, you can't use your somatic components. Or I disable your material components. But also, they are basically interfering with magic, so they have wild magic effect if you stand too close to them and cast a spell you basically roll on the wild magic table to see what happens damn okay they have charms that m draw you into that range they have the ability to blend into walls and go invisible and they're basically very much disruptive in combat that's what i want them to be i want damn. my players to really be like oh fuck oh fuck oh fuck oh fuck oh fuck oh shit mm -hmm. Th that's the mm -hmm. feeling i want at the table when we get to that combat hell yeah sounds fun exactly i want to know more but that's for next time. I want you to tell me everything that happened in there. Hell yeah. Can't wait to hear more about it. But yeah, I uh, I had a session as well on Tuesday. Oh, please tell me. Uh, where a friend of mine GM'd for the first time ever after just starting the hobby about a year ago, roughly. And... Yeah, it was a bit all over the place, but to be honest, to start with a one-shot with a lot of time constraints um, can be quite challenging. I understand that. And mm -hmm. especially in regards to first time GMing and having to, or learning through that to what to keep track of and all of that, he did amazing. It was an amazing one-shot. Nice. It was a lot of fun. And one thing that I really enjoyed was all the story, quote unquote, story flips that happened throughout. It was a bit of a mystery all of the time because once we thought we established something, mm -hmm. went to the next place, that thing got turned up on its head. But that was a constant all of the time. Every, and by the, uh, by the third time this happened, we all know, okay, whatever we get to know will get flipped on its head in some way, shape or form. How can we try to anticipate that? And it was so much fun to engage in that. And it was super fun to interact with our characters through that or to represent that feeling that we as a, uh, as players got through our characters and then engage in the world. It was really, really fun. But yeah, th that has basically been my uh, week for TTRPGs. And then next week we start the new system 
month, quote unquote, that we now um, further into January. And we are starting with the system Tears. I don't know if you heard of it. B-movie, slapstick, comedy, zombie, apocalypse, survival stuff. Yeah. I, I'm, I'm still thinking about what type of storyline for a quick one shot shall be there but i'm are you I'm, jamming all of these systems uh no we are we are switching gems hmm. throughout but yeah i was thinking maybe it being played in berlin and then having a basically a post-apocalyptic hooker bar mm -hmm. and they're gonna need some new tobacco because that ran out have fun really? finding it in the apocalypse i mean sure and then you find tobacco zombies yeah maybe i don't know yet But that yeah. was was one weird thought that crossed my mind. I mean, right, it's a one shot. It's supposed to be testing out a new system. Yeah. I think I think one of the best advice for that is just go with the first idea that comes to mind. Because yeah. you don't want to spend too much time on these one shots. Um as much as they are probably still great, you don't need to spend too much time. Yeah, on it's just this. to get a feeling for it's, it's, if it's that to get a feeling right it's, or not. It's to have fun, first and foremost. And let's be real. The first idea you come up with is oftentimes a very fun idea anyway just post-apocalyptic you need base supplies could be right you need food or water okay let's turn that on its head we need something that is not necessarily essential mm -hmm. necessary for us in some way still yeah right otherwise the business runs out and then let's go uh, stuff like that and and shit and then shit goes on and on and on And then you have a small adventure about just finding fucking supplies for your hookah bar. But yeah, I'm excited for that. What Those other are systems are you playing? One is definitely Starfinder. Okay, then we are trying for the dungeon. Space Train Space Heist. Mm -hmm. The Curse of House Rookwood. Um, and my group wanted to play Aegon. Hmm. I know that already, but the others don't. So perfect. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Okay. Sounds yeah. like a great list of new games. And then every Tuesday from now exactly. on in January, you play new systems. Okay. That's so I'm looking plan, forward. So I'm looking forward to hearing about every single system that you've played mm -hmm. in January then. Um, um, right. Speaking of January, people um, listening to this episode of Double DM, right? This is one of the last episodes of 2023, the second to last. Um, next, next week will be the last episode of 2023. And we will take a break on the 1st of January. There will be no new episode um, in two weeks on the 1st of January 2024 of Double DM Podcast. There will be an episode after that um, again. And I think then until um, our anniversary on the 7th of February, where there might be a special surprise coming as well. And one of the other things is um, we wanted to do another Q&A for our three-year anniversary episode, which is going to be come out on the 5th of February. And for that, we are gathering questions. So if you have a question for Double DM, for us, for generally anything, and you I mean, every single question you want to ask, we will look at it and take it into the episode as long as we don't get too many questions to fill an episode. If we get too many questions, we might have to drop a few or we do another episode or something like that. We will answer every question. Um, there is a questionnaire on Spotify for this episode. So if you're listening on Spotify, you can click on this episode's feed or whatever. And there is a point where you can enter enter your own question or enter an answer. There you could put in your question or you could tag us in one of the many social media posts we might be doing about this Q&A and ask your question there or you could send one per email to us or per social media DMs if you know us on Discord use Discord private messages or something to send us messages we will be talking about the Q&A for like the whole of January and the last part of December you will see it if you have double DM subscribed anywhere on the webs and if you haven't do that now Uh, click the subscribe button here or follow us on everywhere you know the deal you know the fuck um, exactly and with that we have uh, recapped the weeks we have given out the announcement that we needed and we are ready to talk about world building methods hey listener how are you enjoying the show so far Tell us about it in whatever way you see fit. Go to our social media pages and add us or DM us about your favorite episode of the show. We would love to hear from you on what impact our show might have had on your home games. Or you could review us on your podcast app of choice. 
and leave us a nice message with a five-star review. And if you want to go above and beyond, bring a friend into the fold. Tell them about our show and refer us to them so they can get a piece of the pie as well. Thank you for listening to Double DM and joining us on this incredible journey. So Emil, a couple of weeks ago, our main campaign fell through because one of our players couldn't make it, was ill. I, I don't quite remember what it was, but, mm -hmm. uh, but since we wanted to play anyways, I just improvised a one shot for that. You know that feeling, right? Sounds about right as what I do basically every other week since my players <laughs> cancel so often. And uh, what I like to do in these kind of situations, see it as an opportunity to deepen the lore of my world, the, uh, the world that I build with my players uh -huh. together. Since um, I like building worlds and creating lore, but it's so much better when we are already playing a collaborative storytelling game to do it with your players or with the players at the table. Mm -hmm. So um, I think because just multiple reasons for that, just to bind them to the world and have them invested, have them or give them another creative outlet, so all of that stuff. What I did in that instance um, or in the last instance is use the one shot to not necessarily deepen the lore, but um, flesh out the other islands of this island state that they are currently yeah. on or one of the islands and have some sort of possible location where they come back to and them as players already know mm -hmm. that, but their characters don't. And something along those lines is uh, what I wanted to talk to you about today. Using one-shots as a world-building tool, um, creating things not uh, for your main campaign, but for the world itself that then might reoccur in the main campaign itself. Uh -huh. And all of that, and whatever all that entails, basically. But I, uh, the first question that I wanted to ask you is, what is your standpoint on using one-shots as world-building opportunity? Do you do it as well? What do you think about it? Do you think it's a good idea? Yeah, should you do it? Shouldn't you do it? What's your take on that? So I've done it several times. It's not even recently. It's been like over six months at this point. When when a friend of mine came to Berlin, we played TTRPGs together, right? I set those one shots that we played in my world that I use for my fantasy campaigns mostly to first of all flesh out the world a bit. Um, second of all, right, because the world is kind of familiar for, to me and how it works, how the world works then is usable for me in that context, right? I can rely on the things that I've did before and basically use those to build for that one shot, which mm -hmm. for a one shot is great because it's a one shot. While I do want to put in the effort to make the one shot great, I don't want to put in too much effort into just the one shot, right? Mm -hmm. Because we know it is just a one shot, so we can get an excuse to basically play together. That's what happened, right? We just sat together, played together, and it wasn't that much of a high stakes. It was just, let's have fun together together right um, it didn't have to be fancy it just was an excuse to really play together yeah. and it did what it had to do and it was fun however i also used that one shot right to work a little bit more about my world because one of those one shots right i was asked i've said i think i've talked about the false hydra once or twice on this podcast before mm -hmm. and how i don't like it that much the idea of it because it really much becomes gaslighting your players and basically constructing a narrative where they don't feel they can rely on anything while that is fun if everyone agrees to it just throwing it at your players can lead to very weird play experiences in my opinion yeah, agreed we did that and i used that basically because the false hydra was an eldritch monster in my world to actually homebrew a bit about the lore about these eldritch monsters that i I've had about aberrations and stuff like that in my world because I didn't have those before. Hmm. I had one aberration before in the campaign. One. And that was more of a long shot to just throw in to give the paladin a place to question themselves a bit because this aberration basically whispered to him from the shadows and stuff like that. And with that, I really homebrewed a new part of the lore of my game. Where do these aberrations come from? What do they want? And how do they act? However, I want to say, I want to preface this do not make one shots just so you can world build for another campaign they Agreed. need to be their standalone good experience to actually work if you just want to make a one shot to then have new lore that you've made with that one shot sure play a world building game there are games specifically designed to do that for you play one of those if you want that don't play dnd for example to world build 
just for the sake of world building. Play mm. D&D because you want to play D&D. So that's exactly. that. However, if you get new lore or see an opportunity to make new lore with your one-shot, take it. Yeah, sure. But your one-shot should first and foremost always be designed to be a fun one-shot, not a world-building experience, except it's explicitly supposed to be that, but then it shouldn't be designed like a one-shot. It's just important to me to, to, to not invite people to a one-shot, basically promise them an a fun evening that then just dissolves to you actually using them for world building. If that is completely stated beforehand, right, that's totally fine, right? If you tell your players, hey, we can't make our usual game tonight, but I have a cool idea for a certain region of my world where I want you guys to help me world build a bit. Then, right, the expectations are managed. Everyone knows what this one shot is supposed to do. If I come to a player and say, I promise you, hey, I have this very cool one shot idea for this and this and this and this, and then it's basically a three hour session of me just trying trying to make up new lore for certain stuff instead of giving him the experience of that one-time moment that the one-shot is supposed to be. Kind of feels weird, especially, right, if it's supposed to world build for a different campaign. Because yeah. then that one-shot just feels like it's a service to that campaign and not a standalone thing. And that is literally one of the biggest advantages one-shots have. They are a standalone thing. Yeah. They are exactly. supposed to be a standalone adventure and they are supposed to be judged on their own merit, not of how they influence a different campaign in this world in a certain way. That's mm. not how you judge a good one shot. A one shot is, did this single evening have a beginning, middle part and end, had a coherent story or coherent storyline or plot line or whatever and was fun? Mm -hmm. Yes, good. It was a great one shot then. Yeah. But if that all comes to, yeah, it kind of was fun, but it felt like we were just basically making up stuff for this other campaign that, for example, some players might not even play in, mm -hmm. right? that would be even worse. If I had taken my friend that comes to Berlin for one week a year and play with them a game that is just meant to influence a campaign that they aren't even playing in. Yeah, that's just shitty. Sure, they might still have fun playing games. I'm not disputing that you would still have fun playing the game. I'm just saying that you could have probably more fun if you weren't making the experience just to world build for your game. Hmm. The way I usually um, view that or when I hear, yeah, let's play a one shot, um, it's not it's not that I use the one shot itself to uh, world build and create lore, but rather use that as an incentive to create something of my own most or a lot of times when I get asked, can you do a one shot because the main campaign is on hold for now? Sure. Then I sit down and create I, usually all my fantasy games play in the same world, or most of them do. And with that, uh, there comes some sort of famili uh, familiarity. <laughs> what a mouthful. With that world, I know how this world works, roughly. But there are still some details that I purposefully let out, so I have room to build something upon that. And when I hear, let's make a one-shot, then I look at one of these gaps, pick that gap out, and build something there for the one-shot to take place in. I usually put one-shots that are taking place in my world where there isn't anything created for yet. Not mm. because I want the one-shot itself to be the world-building experience, but use that opportunity to incentivize myself to build something more, to create something deeper, to get one step closer to completion of this uh, for this world than I was before the one-shot. And then I don't use my players as lore per se i just use them as an incentive for me to create something more and then yeah obviously my players have impact on the story and on the world itself and therefore create lore anyways but that's just how it works when you play a game or a session in a world that is played in uh, or where other sessions or other campaigns are played in as well because actions have consequences no matter when they happen. When my players do something in a one-shot, even though it has nothing to do with the campaign itself or with the main campaign, and might be even on a completely fucking different continent, it has some implications for the world. Just because my players did something, prevented something, thwarted an evil, or helped one, or failed in protecting the city. Whatever mm. it might be, whatever this may come to, the city didn't exist before the one-shot was in concept. Yeah. Then the one-shot was in concept, so I built the city, or this village, or whatever, right? Then the player 
happens, it's a completely encapsulated thing, a standalone thing, this one shot. And whatever happened in that one shot has still implications on the world after that. How the world, how the country around this city reacts to this city being destroyed. How this information spreads through the world. What destroyed that city and what can be done to prevent some something like this. Just because of that, there will always be some sort of implications for any other campaign, session, one shot, whatever you want to play in the same world. Just coming from this one one shot without even or without using your players as a world building tool themselves. Mm. One big thing, right, for example, for those one shots that I did with my friend that came to Berlin was also that I asked them, here you have a map of my world and I grayed out the area where a campaign is taking place currently. Mm. Wherever you want to have your one shot that we are playing or basically pick two regions for the two different one shots we're playing that week, where do you want them to be? I can make up a story in any of them, in any place, because I have some basic idea of every place and what they're, what the place is like. Mm. Just pick a place and we will do something with that. And then for the first one, they picked a very icy snow tundra region or an, or more even an ice sea, really a sea of ice. And I was like, cool. So um, a small fishing village, you're venturing there there for a certain something, blah, 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 blah. And well, there is a snowstorm coming every single day to town. And the villagers use that snowstorm more or less as a night's rest. Come, They get into their houses and they close the doors and windows and sleep through the snowstorm. Mm -hmm. And then when the snowstorm is done, the day starts for them, right? So that was first de detail number one. Because in this in this region as well, there's it's always sunny. The sun doesn't go down. Okay. Mm -hmm. right, it's a very northern region, like we would have the North Pole, for example, or like here on Earth. And yeah, I I just said, okay, that's the first detail, for example. Um, and, and that was basically the whole setup for the story. And then the snowstorm wasn't a snowstorm. It was a false hydra coming to town, making everyone forget mm. what they are seeing because they can't see the false hydra. They just see a snowstorm. Basic natural explained phenomena and stuff like that, right? And mm. that's how this all kind of worked out. And yeah, I let them pick their spot because that way I ensured for myself that I wouldn't pick a spot I wanted to work build for, but rather let them put a place where they want to have adventure in. When I think of yeah. one shots, especially for example in D&D &D and other like adventure games, right? I always think about my players want an adventure. What makes a good adventure? And how can I get that adventure across in a one shot? Every single place in my world is made for adventure mm. because it is supposed to be a world where you have adventure type games. When you play these adventures. Yeah, I let them pick the place and then build an adventure in that place and use that adventure to world build, mm. not the other way around. Yeah, I really wanted to focus on the one shot first. Mm. And then from that, I derived certain things after the one shot was done for my game. I think you shouldn't force any sort of way to create lore on your players in that regard, in any in any regard, basically. But especially since we're talking about using one shots in that instance, not forcing your players to create a specific kind of lore or a specific kind of location or have a specific kind of impact on that location is key here. Because if you want to use whatever happens in that one shot to feel natural and good for the world let the world be the world itself that means uh, having the yeah. impact of the characters be felt in the way they want it to be felt just mm. basically roll with the punches get hit and see where it leads Mm -hmm. take it and then make something out of it as a group it's a collaborative storytelling game whatever ttrpg you are playing basically work together to create something more because whatever you create as a table is more than just the sum of its parts it's with every campaign you play every one shot you do every session you're in every player everything contributes to this one big thing the story and the world around it and the story itself is one thing the world itself is one thing the characters in there is one thing together they're all okay but they're together so much more than just the characters the world and the story they are a whole construct that is just there's just life in it just because mm. the way they interact no other place no other situation will be the same it's a unique 
thing for every table because just because of the way this all works because the yeah. way you, you can have the same characters it still would play out differently i think one big thing right that you mentioned right it's a construct it's a living thing it's a living breathing organism of story and plot and mm. fun and adventure whatever really really big thing for me is um, i'm a big proponent of not just developing a new world for every campaign you play in but rather developing a big enough world that you can play every campaign you want in that world. Hmm. Right, sure. There might be certain lim limitations, right? If you have a cyberpunk game, you shouldn't put that into a fantasy game, obviously. Yeah. But when you're having, for example, a fantasy world, like I do for Min, every fantasy game I play is going to be played in Min because oh, yeah. that way I create a very, very big world that lives, that my players can identify with. Hmm. It's not that they have to learn a new world every single time. They know the basic laws of how this world works they know places they know names they know things they feel connected to it in a more deeper way that is mm -hmm. in my opinion great for immersion at the table and therefore leads to greater role play if your players in the first campaign right they don't know the world they need to learn about the world good they travel all around the world and the second campaign you you put the same world in maybe like 10 years later or even 10 years earlier however your players know the world now and can identify with it create even better characters in that world, mm -hmm. having known places, Hell can yeah. say, okay, I come from that place. I know how that place feels because my character past campaign was there. And that is where I have to very, very bigly shout out Project Aurora from Senpei from Senpai Suplex on Twitch and Discord and X and Instagram and every social media platform, basically, because it is basically a TTRPG or especially D&D MMORPG. Several game masters, same world, same timeline, running different games happening all over the continent with big events happening at the same time for everyone. Okay, yeah. Sounds Very fun. great project mm -hmm. showing exactly what I mean on a greater scale because, right, they have many people working together on this project, like five to ten. I don't know the numbers exactly right now. Several GMs, um, several GMs working together, creating a world, leading players through the world who will influence storylines in this world that influence other games that are happening basically at the same time out of game at the same day or the day after right this world keeps turning and it, that's a great thing and you can do that too at your home table you don't need several gms and several groups for that you can do it all alone you can do it all on your own alone mm. sure it might not be to the magnified scale that project aurora has sure yes but you can create a living breathing world exactly through setting as many games as setting as many games as you have in that world yeah your main campaign your mm -hmm. second campaign with another group your one shots with the with random friend groups setting them all in that world will create a living breathing world that you first of all can portray for anyone at the table mm -hmm. even if one player only plays in one campaign or even just one one shot not more. They can feel the living, breathing world because you have embodied this world for so long, knowing its intricacies. Mm. And those that play in several games or over a long period of time in one, they feel it too because they get immersed in that game. They have the chance to because you are immersed as well. You are giving them that immersion because hmm. you are yourself. Exactly. And with everything that you've created, you created this big construct of a world and situation basic where every storyline fed into every character you or the players ever portrayed every location they've ever went to and mm -hmm. then you look at that construct and what do you see you see places of recognition or uh, signs of recognition because you already know that place you already know that character the players uh -huh. do you do and it just it, even if they're characters or your characters as npcs don't know these characters you know them which is kind of feed into the nost yeah. nostalgia feeling when you finish a campaign and as new character visit the hometown or the starting village of your old campaign those characters might not know a fucking thing about that but your players will and that's just fucking amazing because yeah. 
just seeing the difference between character knowledge and player knowledge can be a lot of fun at that dynamic. But sure. also having that feeling of nostalgia is so fun at least for me, from first-hand experience. I mean, it's not necessarily even a feeling of nostalgia. It's a feeling of connectedness. It's yeah. a feeling of Re knowledge. Recognition. Um, yeah. And, and yeah. let's be fucking real. I said it before. I will say it again. Being a GM is a fan service position. Hmm. You're supposed to service your players. Your players are not necessarily supposed to be entitled customers demanding whatever they want from you. That's not the that's not the turn value, by the way. It's just you do provide an experience. You do provide the service of running the game for them. And exactly. of course, you want your players to feel all giddy and happy when they meet a certain NPC that they've that they've known before as a player, even though they do not fucking know the NPC as a character. It doesn't fucking matter. It's fun, and you want fun at the table. So stop being such a stick up butt about that. It's just fun. Yeah, or what I love is just dropping names in the campaign. Some in the main campaign, just dropping some names because most of my TTRPG experiences are with the same group mm -hmm. because it's uh, we run three campaigns at the same time in different worlds because three different GMs and run basically every one shot together. It's We are a tight-knit friend group that just plays uh, loves to play TTRPGs together. Mm -hmm. Um, but in when we all play together and just dropping a name here in this one shot, dropping the same name in the main campaign, dropping this name in the campaign before that and all of that. And then suddenly the characters get to meet that named character that I've hinted at so many times. <laughs> the players are going fucking crazy. Their characters yeah. have no clue who this person is. <laughs> Why is the person controlling me so happy right now? Why exactly. is it? What the fuck, dude? Why? Yes. It's a yeah. very important thing. Oh boy. Right? Do you have a specified private group chat with the other two GMs of your game, of those Not games? Not yet. Okay. But uh, we message each other on the on the regular. Okay, okay, okay. Nils, 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 But Nils, we're Nils. all playing very, in three different worlds. Every very, very yeah. off-the-wall suggestion for mm -hmm. you guys. Maybe. How about a convergence as the finale to all three campaigns at the same time. As far as I know, you guys play in two-week intervals, right? Two-week this campaign, two-week that campaign, two-week that campaign. In the meantime, it's a month, a month, a month. A month, a month, a month. Even better. So how about do that? And then it's convergence time. Through some magical fucking means, all of your three worlds converge into one. Yeah, magic merging, fucking, that's why. Merging all worlds into one, pressing it all together. Together, and now you have a certain campaign where all three worlds are the same and characters are all in it and each player um, and I don't know how, how 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 you guys would make that work but it maybe works maybe not but it would be kind of fun be kind of cool and then you have right then you then you would have a, a some must sound a unified world of all three of your games and can then when all three campaigns are over start over a new all three in the same world for example if you keep on doing that mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and then basically even enhance that factor of hinting at something in a different campaign that theoretically is isn't canon in this campaign because now everything is canon in each world. And now you okay, yeah, okay, do all okay. that together. <laughs> yeah, sounds like fun. And yeah. the good thing is I don't have uh, I only have to mention it to one of the, the GMs because I know one of the other uh, the other one is listening to every fucking episode. Oh, easy. Yeah. Shout out Nico. Shout out Anyways. Nico. I don't know you but hey, uh, we were his top podcast this year, by the way. 14 yeah. people, by the way, had Double yeah. DM as their top podcast this year. Thank you for that. Anyway, top. <laughs> so, yeah. yeah. Sounds like a fun idea. I will yeah. definitely um, yeah. mention that and think about it. <laughs> sounds really fun. Yes, yeah, it sounds actually very kind. One of the bad things of having a game where every campaign plays in the same world is I can't do that. Mm. It's literally a problem. I cannot do that anymore because it already has happened basically in my world. Yeah, okay. Imagine okay. if I had the chance to do that now. Oh boy, do I need to start another world? Oh no, anyways, uh, right? <laughs> Let's build no. another world. No, Hell no, yeah. no, 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 <laughs> no, 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 no. Maybe at some point. Okay, back to the topic at hand. Reusing of stuff, making some, making a living, breathing world. Do you have any further questions? Anything that you want to discuss in this episode today hmm. just uh, I, I think where we talked about that that we like it it's just maybe let's 
talk a bit more about the process itself in reusing certain mm -hmm. parts of the world that you created um, and what to look out for in uh, to not overdo it and all of that stuff. Do you have any general tips, g general ideas thrown out there when it comes to re reusing content that you've as a, you as a group created? So when it comes, for example, to reusing characters... Mm -hmm. For me, it needs to be done in a certain manner that does not overshadow the actual game at hand. Mm -hmm. Because when I look at, for example, I, I, I take I take um, I take example in TV shows, for example, doing a celebrity cameo or something. Yeah. If that episode has a celebrity cameo, that's fine and good, but only if that cameo isn't overshadowing the actual episode. Mm -hmm. If that cameo is well-placed in that episode, has a, has a very good reason it to be in that episode, and it's not just, yay, we had the money to buy the celebrity for an episode. The same goes for your TTRPGs. Do you just want to name drop something? Then, while yes, it could be fun, you don't need to do it, and you shouldn't. Mm -hmm. No, If it's just name dropping something for the same sake of name dropping, Eh. But if it's name dropping, for example, the weapon one of the other characters in the last campaign used now as a legendary artifact, mm -hmm. the sword of Helm Frost or something, while the cleric's But where the party's cleric last campaign was called Helmfrost is now a legendary artifact that you yeah. need to, I don't know, kill a certain frost giant or something that is terrorizing the region. Mm -hmm. Heck can fucking do that, yes. Yeah. But if you just want to name drop Helmfrost for the sake of ha half Helmfrost, eh, it eh. needs to be explained mm. in, in a certain context that works for the game and the world you're in, right? Mm -hmm. For example, if, if the Cleric Helmfrost last campaign saved a certain town and now the town has a statue of him, you don't need to explain more than that because, right, the players know it. They have the context. Yeah. Then you can just do that, especially if it's the same town. Mm -hmm. um, but when you want to bring in something, it needs to be somewhat contextual and understandably yeah. for your players. They need to understand, okay, that is the context of that and it makes sense because if it makes sense, they will go, okay, that's fucking cool, right? If a certain desert village names itself Helmfrost after a dwarf from the north that they've never seen. Yeah, no, just no, no, make no, sense. no, 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 doesn't make sense at all. But if that town in the desert is named Helmfrost, you better have a reason why that cleric from the north, the dwarven cleric from the north, got yanked down to the desert and then did something amazing. So the city said, hey, Let's rename us for the sake of our savior or something along those lines. There needs to be context because like we said, when you play games in the same world over and over and over again, which is amazing, you create something coherent in some way. You create something living and therefore you need something that binds this all together. And this is context. Context is the yeah. glue that keeps everything that you create in one or in one thing or as one creation mm -hmm. without context you just have pieces mm -hmm. the context yeah. make it so it's a living thing yeah and that's the important part always think about context and in regards to using characters especially i think you have to be careful in a way if mm -hmm. it's if you're reusing npcs you have all the information what the npc would have done and why and blah 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 but uh, what i like to do is um reusing player characters And I, I really enjoy that. But I think as soon as the campaign with that character is over, to a certain degree, the player, uh, the, this character doesn't only belong to the player anymore. It belongs to the world. And therefore, I have some some sort uh, semblance of control over it in a way, but always in conjecture and talk with that uh, with the player of that certain character. And I think this is where you have to be careful a lot when you, you reuse player characters as NPCs in your world for the new characters to meet. It's an am amazing thing thing to do because like we said reusing things and having characters that the player already knows but the character doesn't fun stuff but what i like to do in that instances is have a one-on-one -on -one with the player of said character to discuss what that character would have done in the time between those two campaigns what would the character be doing currently why it might be something completely out of topic the young brash fighter that then completely 
disrupted uh, the rising of the cult of the dragon queen for example i don't yeah. know then becomes a fucking baker <laughs> yeah there needs to be a talk with your player why if your player mm -hmm. says yeah he wants to be a baker okay but what led him to be a baker after he successfully mm -hmm. defeated tiamat or the dragon queen or whatever the fuck this fighter did have a talk with your players about what your characters would have done in the meantime and after you fin finishing campaign have some sort of a conclusion episode where you talk a bit about what your character's life will now be and then when you want to reuse that character in a later campaign you have a rough estimate in where the direction is going and then talk a bit about uh, that with your players again to did they stick to that path roughly or did they just did a complete 180 who the fuck knows right the player would mm -hmm. know player of said character would know so talk to them and then create something together and add that new kind of living thing into the mix already and make it even more beautiful yeah i think right as you said you need to have a talk with the player is with the player of a character about that character's future mm -hmm. and or, or where or, or their path after a campaign right we've all done this when we finished a campaign we have we've had a talk with the entire group of where is this going where are the characters going where do they retire what do they do with their life do they help people do they change do they right we've we've had these wrap-up sessions ourselves if we've yeah. had if we finished up campaign we've had these wrap-up sessions I, I i love the wrap-up session of our um you know witcher campaign in that regard mm -hmm. it was a lot of fun yeah right if i now would play another Witcher game, right? I could reference what happened in that wrap-up session because, right, I know what you guys said would be true for your character, right? My character settles and writes a book. My character settles and lives the rest of his life happily there and there. My character dies there and that. I can use those facts, but I respect your decision for that character because it is your character. If I would take your character out of their own context and push them to somewhere where I want them to be, you might not identify with that character anymore when I bring it back up. And then the entire point of bringing your character back into the campaign for you to feel great at the table is completely fucking moot. Mm -hmm. I just destroyed the entire thing I wanted to do by not doing what should have been done and presenting the character. That is more than just a name and a look. The character is a personality. Character is a story that happened to that mm. character and that is happening to that character. I cannot just change that. Exactly. Respect what your players want to do with their characters and then show them what you've made out of their wishes basically yeah because as you are portraying the world you have some sort of influence on that but no say in it mm. i think that this is a good condensation of what we just talked about is you as the portrayer of the world and then the portrayer of said npc or now npc have some sort of semblance of influence on the ex-player character mm -hmm. but no say in what really is going on and i think right. that, that that's important to keep in mind right i think that at some point right when your player basically hands in their character and the campaign is done they become an npc and you do get to control them but in a certain way that makes sense for what happened to the character right if for example the thing with the baker thing the example right it, your character can become a baker if you as the gm say so but it just needs to has needs to make sense for that character beforehand if that player basically said yeah he's gonna look for a new hobby to basically lay down his weapons and stop fighting and you decide that's baking then that's baking that's exactly the, you as a gm can decide that because it's now an npc and that's mm -hmm. one of the things right these characters are npcs in that moment the player hands them basically in if they exist further in your campaign they are now an npc you as the gm get to control them you get to do whatever you want to them but at the end of the day even though you can do whatever you want and i really want to preface this you can do whatever you want it is only really fun if it is done with the context it only makes sense when it's done with the context and let's be fucking real it feels better to anyone you as you included if it is done with context yeah as with everything context is just important mm -hmm. and as I had before it's the fucking glue that holds everything uh, holds everything together yeah one other thing that i think that you can do to basically build a more coherent world with one shots characters and items and stuff like that is right aside from talking to your players look for inspiration a lot mm -hmm. and i know this sounds completely confusing at first but take your favorite video game favorite book series favorite movie favorite tv series favorite even favorite music or whatever take your favorite media and when you start to get influenced 
buy a certain type of media and use that for your games, as everyone does. Mm -hmm. For example, if it's music, you're inspired by a certain musician's music to write so stuff for your campaign. The best thing you can do to create a coherent world when you are influenced by a certain musician is to listen more to that musician or to the genre that musician creates music in to create a coherent world because, right, the sound is somewhat yeah. familiar. The sound is the same. The sound is the same musician. Mm. It literally writes itself because yeah. there's a certain theme behind that video game you're liking. And if you take some inspiration from The Witcher 3, for example... Why not look at The Witcher 2 as well and take inspiration from that? Or mm. take more inspiration from The Witcher 3, not just from one particular region, but from all the different regions. Yeah. Because that world is built coherently, at least to some degree, right? It can mm. always There can always be some kind of loopholes in someone's world building. Yeah, yeah sure. That's just the way it is because you can't think of everything. Yeah, in yeah. yours there is as well when you world build Hell yourself, yeah. right? So it doesn't matter. But when you take certain parts of that world, if you take more of that world, those parts will stay together and stick still together. That's one, one of the things I said about world building, right? World building is like building a giant puzzle. Everything yeah. you build for world building should fit to certain other parts. Because mm -hmm. if it fits together, it feels coherent and good. And if you take inspiration from something, you can take more from that certain something because those things already do fit together. Exactly. And uh, j just because you mentioned it, uh, that not everything that you create is coherent just because it can't be, it doesn't mean that it always has to stay that way necessarily. If you always, uh, let's stick with the jigsaw puzzle example or um, simile in that regard. If you build your world as a jigsaw puzzle, just make sure that every piece of um, things that you build has the option to be connected to other things. So even if you have a hole in the middle of that complete picture, it's there's still a way to fill that plot hole. And let me tell you, having plot holes and then using your or having one shots taking place in that uh, in these plot hole areas you could say and then fill that up with meaningful interactions by you and the characters and the players is an amazing thing because yeah. then it all loops back together and creates a smooth finish <laughs> for whatever yeah. you want it's just mm -hmm. this is the stuff you guys yeah. This is the yeah. stuff. And one of the other things um, for reusing other stuff, right, especially right from other media, taking entire regions of the Legends of Zelda or something, your players are going to recognize it. Hell yeah. And again, it's fan service. They're going to love it. They're going to feel immersed. They're going to know what to do. They're going to feel at home. And I think mm -hmm. feeling at home is a very good description of that because they know it, they feel comfortable in it. And that is kind of what your game world is supposed to evoke. Even if your game world is grim dark, it should give your players a feeling of, I know this world, I know this place, and I feel great playing in this game. Yeah, My character I, might be feeling like shit all the time. Exactly. I mean, I'm a big fan of Bloodborne, for example, and creating a place that, that isn't a place yet now in my world, but cre uh, for example, creating a place, something along the lines of Yarnum. I as a player would feel so at home there, but my character would be scared shitless. It's just mm. the way it is. But I as a player know the rough layout. I know what creatures that... I can expect. My player doesn't expect, uh, my character doesn't expect any of those, but I as a player do. And that feels, that fills me with some form of excitement, some form of exciting, an exciting sense to see what is going on, what, what's going to happen next. Mm. And that is just something that you can evoke with, um, or only that you can only evoke through familiar, uh, familiarity, some form of quote unquote nostalgia, recognizability, and just the feeling of being at home as a player not as a character different ex distinction there that doesn't mean that your player uh, that your character can't feel at home there it just means that it doesn't uh, that your character doesn't have to right this episode is about the players feeling good Exactly. And you do that through this little bit of fan service and through throwing in little hints to either older characters older places that they've known from other campaigns or even just using stuff from video games and movies and TV series that they know 
right? Even if you just change, change small parts of the names and stuff like that, they're going to recognize it. And that recognizability is actually a plus for you. Some people oh, say yeah. it's a negative. I understand why, because it might be distracting from the game. But I think you're taking the game a little bit too serious for my taste in that regard then. Yeah, in my experience, it has never been a problem at all. Yeah, right. Okay, yeah, my players, I might be laughing and joking at the table, but what do you fucking happy. do? It that, means, that they're, means happy. they're fucking happy and that makes a good game. No, but the thing is, right, I exactly want that from my game. I exactly. don't want my players to sit around the table and for four hours trying to be the most intense role players like they're fucking doing a theater performance for a fucking prize. No, we're sitting around the table having half of us have a fucking chip in their mouth at the moment and we're just crunching away on snacks, having fun, drinking I don't know, beer or Coke or something and having a good time. Part of that is just making fun of stuff. Sure, there might be inside jokes that might go a little bit too far. Sometimes I can speak from experience when my players have um, for seven hours straight in one session basically changed every word that didn't have a KR at the beginning of it to a KR at the beginning of it replacing the first letter with it which was <laughs> very quite annoying. But at the end of the day, it was fun and that is the main part and I know for a fact I can evoke and feeling of home and comfort and recognizability by reusing old stuff. And at the same time, one big thing is reusing old stuff. It saves you prep time. Hell yeah. Friendly <laughs> gems. If you, Hell yeah. If you put in an NPC that the players have already known, for example, an old character, you have an easy half to one hour time of them just listening to this character speak and you can improvise that shit because, right, you know the fucking before. story they've done. <laughs> yeah, yeah but, uh, but one thing that you just mentioned before that is um, when your players are happy and feel comfortable at your table, it automatically leads to a smoother and a quote-unquote better gaming experience. And it might lead to exactly what you just said, these theater-worthy performances or can lead to that. But if they are, if your players don't feel comfortable to do that, it won't happen at all. So yeah, there might be sessions where it's just joking around, but who cares? It's fun. That's mm. what we're here for. And with that, I don't have anything else to talk about. Likewise, do you? likewise. All right. So with that, thank you all for listening and hear you on the next one. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you for listening to this episode of Double DM. It appears you liked this one. What we had to say and our advice helped you. Why not show us how we helped you in a rating? Or even write a review detailing us how we helped. You can do this on the platform that you are listening on right now. It's just a few clicks, doesn't take long, and helps us out. It gets us out there and our advice into more ears of more people. Thanks again for listening and joining us on this amazing journey. Have a great day and see you on the next one. Bye bye.